again, hopefully you stay in track three all day because it is the best track here. Um, my job is to announce the speakers, keep us on time, um, comment for a week. Uh, so uh, I, I'd like to, to introduce Joshua now. Joshua, Joshua um, Widener is uh, currently uh, information assurance, uh, or has his MBA from in information assurance from Fort Hayes State University. Um, I believe you uh, are at Baker now, right? Um, which is my MBA alma mater. So. Um, he holds every security certification there is known to man. Um, I'm not going to list them all off. Um, I will turn it over to you. You can introduce yourself a little bit more if you like, and we'll get right into the presentation. Um, again, um, if, you, if you have cell phones, please make sure the is off. And with that, just take it over. Thank you. Uh, my name is Joshua, but I go by JJ because there's uh, a lot of Joshuas out in the world. So in my first grade class, there's three Joshuas. So to give myself a self you know, sense of identity, I went by JJ uh, for my whole life. I, uh, you know, I haven't been in the space as long as a lot of other professionals, uh, probably about three or four years, but I've been in IT for over 10 years, and it's just been IT and information security has been embedded in IT uh, in everything I've done. So it's just over the past three years, I really uh, focused on getting certifications and just setting that goal, studying as hard as I can, taking the test, achieving the goal, then what's the next certification? So I am kind of a, a, side of a certification junkie of the CISSP, CISM, CISA, CRIS, CIPPE, which is the GDPR, CIPM, Dell Booming for free. So I just, I'm going after AWS security next. So I really enjoy that. In case you didn't know, my privacy alias is Golden Cheetah. So um, in case you're wanting to search me out, I'm joking, that's not. Uh, Father of Dragons was my next choice, but Father of Dragons doesn't really have a good ring to it. So, um, so my talk, along my progress of getting certification after certification, I wanted to go after the CISSP first, and then I just, I kept trying to find, you know, I really enjoyed the ISACA certification process, IC squared's uh, great as well. And then I just naturally progressed to information privacy. And there's a great segue in the keynote, and I want to thank you, Leslie, uh, for being here. I don't want to uh, shine the light on you, but thank you for sharing that, because that was a great segue to privacy and, and what we're seeing from a legislative sense and what we're seeing coming down the pipe. We are getting ready to embark on one of the most legislated pieces of uh, cybersecurity, information privacy, that, I mean, in history. I don't I mean, this is unprecedented on how many regulations are going to be coming out. So I'm going to share on that a little bit. Um, share a little bit on the GDPR, CCPA, the New York Cybersecurity Law, the NAIC um, Information Data Security Law, I think that's what it's called. So my biggest thing is security doesn't equal privacy, uh, but we can't have privacy without security. Uh, it's just most of us understand that and know that, but I advocate for that. Even though uh, we secure things, that doesn't necessarily mean they're private. And, you know, whenever Leslie was sharing about, you know, how, how is this data going to be managed? Who's going to be auditing it? Who has control of it? Is it being resold? You know, who knows when I'm going to be home or not? That's, you know, even though the data might be secure, but what are those policies and procedures that, that we're implementing as an organization to make sure that the data is, is being processed in accordance with law, in accordance to what the, you know, what the, for the end user, for the, the user of our services, what's best for them? A uh, great quote, I read the presentation preparation that you need to have a quote in your presentation, so here's my quote. When it comes to privacy and accountability, people always demand the former for themselves and the latter for, for everyone else. So, you know, I want privacy, uh, but I want people to be accountable for it. It's the essence of the quote, so. So, new privacy, everybody's probably heard of the GDPR. Um, is anybody in here like a data privacy officer or works solely in privacy? Part of, part of my the second half to my, my hat. So. All right. So I, I think we'll probably start seeing uh, if anybody who's in the session prior of adding stuff more stuff to our plate and it's an IT burnout. I have a feeling information security professionals are going to have privacy embedded and um, making sure that we have our privacy principles and, and that stuff ingrained inside of everything that we do as well. I could be wrong. If your organization is large, you might be able to uh, to have one of those that are solely focused on privacy. Uh, CCPA, uh, I'm sure if you've been reading up on any privacy regulations, CCPA is coming down the pipe. 
or it's actually going to be enforced January 2020. And for any cloud provider or anybody using cloud services, that means our data is going through California, most of it, if they're, if they're located in California. Uh, again, I don't know how that's going to play out, but I believe a lot of us are going to be impacted. I believe over 500,000 businesses across the United States will be impacted by the CCPA. And the, the new U.S. federal privacy law, um, you know, there's not a whole bunch of uh, information on this, but it is coming. But we can see that uh, I don't think us as U.S. citizens are going to allow the EU to have a law that we have to abide by if we're not going to hold ourselves accountable to a certain degree for the, the private information that we have. So there's a lot of senators, a lot of bills in the House and Congress trying to get more privacy regulation put out there. Um, the Government Accountability Office, they, they provide auditing, evaluation, investigative service for the United States Congress. They just released a report in February, you know, 56 page report about the need for more privacy legislation. So there's going to be something coming out. I don't know when, um, I, but there will be something. Uh, so so I, in my uh, building of this presentation, I wanted to provide something that um, that might be helpful. I don't know how helpful it is after writing up the description of what I was going to talk about and then the research I was doing. I don't know if it's actually going to be a, a beautiful picture of how this is going to look. I don't think it's going to be very beautiful. I think there's going to be a lot of a lot more legislation, a lot more uh, figuring out what we're going to do with this. But the GDPR, rights of EU citizens, these are the big ones, lawfulness, fairness, transparency, being transparent with your policies. What is that? Where, where is that data going? Who has control over the data? Who's processing the data? Where is the data stored? Is it encrypted at rest? Encrypted in transit? You know, is it being audited? Is there being a risk of assessment performed? You know, on and on and on. What, where is this data going? Who's governing it? Um, who's accountable for it? Are your board, are your uh, your board, are they going to be on the hook if there's a breach or if there's an issue with with private data? You know, th those types of things that we need to uh, understand that, that that I believe us as consumers we need to make a push for if we're not already. Uh, purpose limitations: How long are we going to keep the data uh, and actually stick to that and not say we're going to have a retention of seven years and keep it forever? Uh, data minimization, so that gets to anonymization and pseudonymiz pseudonymization. Uh, if you're pseudonymizing data, you're, re you're trying to remove any of the personally identifiable pieces of the data, but the data is still intact. You're just taking away the personal element. But if you were to infer two data sources, you could still make an identifying case of who that person might be or maybe what gender, race, ethnicity they are as well. Uh, and you know, I, you can read this, I don't want to read it off to you. So and it's interesting on the rights of Californians, uh, you know, it, it's very similar on what the CCPA and GDPR are trying to do here. Those privacy principles are, are going to be the same across, you know, a lot of these red, red, uh, regulations that are coming out. Uh, I think the CCPA with the, the sale of personal information, they took it a little bit further to actually base it on what are you selling my information for? Uh, it, the GDPR also has that, but the way that the CCPA called that out, I found that very interesting. So in each one of these privacy regulations, there's a security element. So each one of them has a section on acceptable or reasonable security, but there's no prescription of what the reasonable, like what's reasonable to a small business or SMB to a corporation. You know, what's reasonable for the controls that we have to have, have in place. Is there a reasonable security that we need to have? Yes, of course. Um, but there's no prescription to say, hey, you need to follow this cybersecurity framework. Or, hey, you need it with COVID 2019. Um, I had a, I was at ISACA's lunch uh, two months ago, and there's a speaker there that actually was going to Israel, and they want to be two uh, COVID 2019 compliant for the whole banking industry in Israel. And for those of us that know Israel, I mean, they're like the number two cyber you know, cyber powerhouse in the world and they're a state the size of Missouri. You know, their, their country is the size of Missouri. So it's very interesting that they want to be COVID 2019 compliant. And if anybody's looked at COVID, that is uh, un unbelievable. They want to be like the tier five level, which is uh, crazy to me. So GDPR is not prescriptive. They, they say appropriate security of the personal data. Uh, you know, they mention encryption in there multiple times, but there's no real prescription. So what, what is reasonable to one might not be reasonable to another. Um, then the CCPA, 
non-prescriptive. It has a little bit more in there. The California Office of the Attorney General said the CIS top 20 are reasonable. So is that reasonable to all entities, all organizations, to get every CIS control implemented? Um, it might be, and, you know, if that's the law, then we're gonna have to figure out a way to do it, and that might be what some of us need to, to make sure that we have the power to go to our board or to our cabinet and say, hey, uh, you know, this is the law, we gotta, we gotta have funding to be able to get the CIS top 20. You know, if we can get the top six, and I read somewhere if we can get the top six, we can reduce up to 85%. I don't know what, what organizations are looking at for that data, but I find that very interesting as well. Let's see how we're on time. All right. So the security law side, I just, I was looking at the NYDFS, so, so the GDPR and CCPA, has anybody read those top to bottom? Yeah, they, they're, uh, they're, fun, they're a fun challenge to read through, but great information. Um, I actually have an app on my phone that I, whenever I was studying for the certification test, I will just go through the app on my phone. It's a Phil Fisher app, I believe. And, just look over all the, read all the articles, read all the comments, there's a lot of comments. Um, anybody read the New York DFS cybersecurity regulation? Or, yeah, so I know if, if Sprint's in the house, I know if Sprint and uh, a couple others are really looking at this one as well. Um, the NAIC insurance data security model law, anybody read those? Yeah, we got some readers over here, yeah, you gotta <laughs> stay up on that. Yeah, so I. I haven't read them all line for line, but I did go through uh, multiple and take notes on all of them. You know, I did see some commonalities on what the what the prescription was for security, but still there was it was still semi-prescriptive on what we need to do. A lot of of vague generalities, and some of those were, they have like control groups we need to have. Uh, so what are those control groups we need to have? You know, the the auditing, uh, you know, making sure we have proper processes in, and we're looking at our people, processes, technology. Um, you know, our, there's, I don't want to get to all the controls, but there's a, the NIST, a, you know, framework, you know, are we going to do 853 and look at all the controls that we need to do there? Um, and this I found very interesting. So there's a Cybersecurity Disclosure Act that's, it was kind of a one-off. I was just researching um, new uh, bills or, you know, new regulations that are being submitted and uh, that one's the new one. And then this is, in 2018, there's more than 265 bills or resolutions related to cybersecurity that was submitted to either House or Congress. So that's, that's a lot. And so I, I believe each state is submitting, um, you know, I don't know if county, local, municipal governments are submitting, you know. So it's really interesting, the landscape on how we're gonna see regulations come down and, and how many of them are gonna be. So as I was saying, it's a little bit more prescriptive um, for the for the New York cybersecurity law, and you can read those about information security, data governance, asset inventory, access controls. I bet if we look at a lot of these, those CIS top 20 are going to be embedded in there some somewhere. So uh, in the NAIC insurance data security model law, semi-prescriptive. So it's saying let's implement these controls based on a risk assessment. Who would agree that you would want to base your controls off of a risk assessment? <laughs> I mean, yeah, I mean, it makes sense, but most of them, if they're not in the field, or, or some would say the risk assessments might cost too much, you know? Let's just implement this, yeah. I welcome comments too or questions. Why can't you do your own internal risk assessment given the knowledge of the business? I mean, exactly, yeah. Or in healthcare, you can't. But uh, I mean, Patriot does publish a, a uh, small, it's really written for small or small businesses and uh, doctor's offices more, but you can't. There, it's in the law, you can do it yourself or not. Right. Yeah, and I, I don't think it says it needs to be a third party risk assessment. So if we're doing our own internal risk assessment, you know, what model are we using? Is that is that the best practice model that we need to use? Uh, yes, yeah, so that's, that's great information. You're right. Can we internally assess? How often should we get a third party assessment? Um, I was listening to the speakers talk last night, and, and I'm not as deeply technical as, you know, as, as some sitting around the tables, but, you know, they were, they were talking about, you know, why are we spending all this money to do full blown risk assessments and just have pen testing done on our applications? I believe, I don't know if that was a conversation you were having, um, but you know, there's, so there's different ways that we can go around assessing the risk for our applications, assessing the risk for, for our, our human element, you know, the, the 
the big challenge is there. So what is the correct prescription? I don't know. I, I didn't know what doctor to put up on here, so I figured if I was going to because that, and I don't want this to be a negative connotation, but if we have legislators, hopefully they're reaching out to cybersecurity professionals, and I believe they are, but if, if they're, you know, figuring out what are they going to throw at us, you know, what, what needs to be, uh, <laughs> thanks, I was hoping I would get some laughs. <laughs> yeah, actually, uh, I was teaching my daughter to bring your kids to, to school, or not school, bring your kids, I work at Bacon University, so it is kind of bring your kids to school. Uh, but bring your kids to work day, and we were working on animations for PowerPoint, so I got to go listen to my daughter, so that was pretty cool. Uh, so what is the correct prescription? There's no, if anybody wants to answer this, I, it's going to depend on what your business is. It's going to depend on what data you have. You know, what's your risk element? Um, what do you want to spend the money? What do you have resources and, and money to spend on uh, to, to get the correct prescription? But do you think, does anybody in here think that we will see a prescription from Regulations say you need to implement this CSF. You need to implement. I know with like FedRAMP and some of the FISMA rules. I mean, you know, this 853. Some of them are already doing that. But do you think at a federal level for all businesses, do you think that'll be possible? I think it'll be lobbying against it too much. I know the AMA does. Yeah. They want some in there, but they don't want everything. And then some of the uh, the financials can be the tightest because PCI internal. Yeah, DSS is another big one. So each business is different. So privacy, and I believe we all should believe this, privacy is an inalienable right. It is something that we should take ownership of. And, that, and I was I was geeking out whenever you were sharing, like, this is my data. Whenever Les was sharing about this is my data, I don't want know somebody to know when I'm home, when I lock my door, when I turn my water on. So, you know, so if we're not taking ownership of that, and, advocating for our own consumer rights when it comes to our private data, then you know what's going to stop anybody from selling and make money off of it and then you know if somebody's criminally acting on that data uh, to whatever they want to do you know that's a very scary situation so will these regulations and this is something I read in a blog post or an article I don't know how, uh, how much weight it has but do you think some of these GDPR CCPA other regulations will prevent because Let's say we prescribe a whole bunch of controls and a whole bunch of security. Do you think it'll prevent small businesses from being able to come to market? I think the big businesses want more regulation because it prohibits competition. Right. How would you be able to come to market if you have to not only develop and deploy an application, but also have a full-blown security staff? I mean, of course we want security embedded, but, but you're right. I mean, it, if you if you have a whole bunch of prescriptive stuff that you can have to do before you can release an application, then there's going to be a lot less competition out there. And the risk. risk. Yes, the risk. Yeah. Could you explain to expand a little bit more? Like if you try to build out as a, a company and you're looking at just the logistics of paying the people to get the work done, but if you're measuring how much money can I possibly make in this field, and what is the risk of associated uh, holding the data? in my systems right? and I could get blown away or put in jail, you know, like Yeah, and yeah, we I didn't even touch on holding board members accountable or executives accountable and going to jail for, you know, for negligence on on security principles, you know, stuff like that. So yeah, that's a the data risk is huge, you know, especially if you're mining data and reselling data. Um, so I, mean, I think this is self-answerable. I, I don't think there's a prescriptive model that would hit all small businesses in Fortune 500s. We all shook our head no. That's, I don't see how that would be possible. Now, should there be, uh, as they are vaguely putting it, the appropriate safeguards in place to protect our data? I believe so. But you know, who are they going to be accountable to? Who are they going to? Um, you know, what what methodology are they going to use? Any, so anybody here right now tracking all their GRC? documentation in the system. I'm sure some of, some of us are, yeah. And there's a lot. If we're starting to comply with these regulations, we have to provide documentation, policies, procedures, training mechanisms, you know, just all this documentation. And if you're tracking it for New York uh, security law, and you're tracking it for GDPR, and you're tracking it for CCPA, you, you know, on and on and on, how do you, and each one of these regulations might need different pieces of uh, documentation for that. So I, I um, I currently don't have a system, but I, I do believe there's a, a 
a big market for it right now. I think RSA Archer is a good one. I'm not trying to name vendor names, but uh, NIST CSF and 837R2, those are uh, two of the ones. So 837R2, just this last year, included privacy in the risk management framework. So if you have it reread, 837 revision two, it just released, I believe, December 18, or no, maybe it was like May, May of 18. Uh, but it actually included privacy inside of the risk management framework. So there's controls in there, things you can audit against. COVID 2019, very, uh, it's the framework to manage all the frameworks. So whenever I said, how are you going to manage all the documentation and, and uh, how, what maps to what? So I know this compliance regulation says I need to have NIST CSF. And I, this compliance, I need to have um, just the New York cybersecurity law. And it will actually have those mappings. I don't know if uh, cybersecurity law is in there yet, but it'll have all those mappings for the COVID framework. And so you can say, well, if I have this control objective in place for my business, it maps to all these different frameworks. So it's the framework to, to like manage all framework. Anybody here using COVID 2019? It's a, it's, it's a big, it's a, some call it the 800 pound gorilla, it's huge. I mean, there's, and there's a lot of controls in there, but it's not prescriptive. It's, you, 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 you make it for your business. So, uh, that's all I have. I think I'm over time. Uh, thank you for the feedback and any questions. I'll be up here for a little bit. I'm not a full-blown expert. Um, but yeah, you can find me on LinkedIn. That's my email address. Um, I appreciate your attention. Yes, question. Uh, do you feel like, so GDPR obviously read through the whole uh, regulation yeah. and a lot of it, as you said, is like very broad. Lots of generalizations. So do you think that that we've gained any clarity from some of the examples of enforcement that have happened most recently, or? So you're talking about the, all the uh, like Facebooks and the, the other, like whenever they in, enact a penalty on someone? Yes, or, yeah. Yeah, I think we're gonna see, I mean, it's, it's legislation, so it's gonna be litigated, and there's gonna be changes made to it, the, you know, amendments made to it. Right. But there's a lot of requ the, the comments that are associated with the GDPR, <coughs> if you actually read through all the comments, there's a little bit more explanation on how they're going to govern that and how they're going to regulate that, who will be penalized, who won't. Uh, but I don't know if I'm clearly answering your question, but we can have a conversation about it. I'm, I'm not a lawyer and I'm not. So they say if you're going to try to comply with GDPR, hire a lawyer, hire a lawyer, hire a lawyer. It's, you know, it's all litigated. So. Yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, I think it's just more of a, just trying to get your feel on, uh, because it because it is so wide open. Yeah, it's like, okay, you know, let's try and do what we can with our own interpretation of this, mm -hmm. and then hopefully as more cases of enforcement come into, let just come in and become, uh, you know, a, a case that the information is released to the public eye, that more clarity is gained yeah, on think, how they're going to enforce things. I think we'll, we'll see a case-by-case -case basis, and they don't have to be proven. You don't have to, but the good thing is they have the, the register, uh, the authority, and I forgot the name of it off the top of my head, but there's an authority in the EU that will take the, the request from anybody that might be a consumer of the state, <coughs> and then they'll go after the company um, as well. So yeah, it's, a, it's, gonna be it's an advocate or something? I don't remember. I, remember, I know what you're talking about. And the only other thing I was going to say is that... Supervisory authority. Yeah, supervisory authority. Um, there's a platform, I mean, I don't like specifically condone or deny it or whatever, but it's an online, it's called eComply, and they've come up with what I thought was a pretty intuitive way for mostly like medium to small companies who want to like have some help stepping through GDPR mm -hmm. and it basically asks you information about the company and helps you build out the forms like the data processing agreements and everything and kind of builds them for you with information that you can easily put in that you know about the company and helps you kind of start to do work towards compliance and it's really inexpensive so e -compliant. I technically have a referral link somewhere but that would be too much work. Well, Just go you. find it online. Yeah, thank, thank you for sharing that. Thank you, yeah. everyone, for your attention and for listening. I was nervous. It's my first B-Sides, first time presenting at this conference. So thank you for coming. And <laughs>